One of the most attractive and at the same time most enigmatic monuments to Valencian art is the Royal Monastery of Santa Maria del Puig. A long process of recuperation and restoration has recently been concluded at the monastery and its architecture and outward appearance today are accepted as a convention, in a way a common sight to most people in Valencia. As a center of prayer and pilgrimage, the Puch Monastery inspires many thousands of people who visit it each year. But at the same time, there seems to be a curious, unintentional blindness in many people's approach to it. The architecture of the monastery, on closer examination, is something strange, stemming from a distant past, with perhaps hieroglyphic meanings, and hence not easily understood. Not in vain have 700 years gone marching by. What we shall be attempting to achieve here is a thorough understanding of the Monastery of Santa Maria in its historical context, focusing on architecture and meaning with emphasis above all on the significance that its builder monks enveloped in its midst. El Puig de Santa Maria From the night of the times to the eternal murmur of stone Archaeology, without iconography, is like a body without a soul, a lamp of gold, unlit. Only iconography shows us the new Jerusalem descended from heaven. Its stones are alive, and when the children of the great Christian family cease their praises, they will then continue in their task, repeating in inexpressible harmony, Hosanna Filio David. Among the Mercedarian monasteries of our peninsula, Santa Maria del Puig, located on the Mediterranean coast near the city of Valencia, stands out for its architectonic beauty. The founding of the sanctuary of El Puig traces its most recent origins to King Jaime I's reconquest of the city of Valencia, which explains its denomination as the Valencian Covadonga, in remembrance of the epic battles which took place there. Having plotted the crusade of Valencia and following the route earlier taken by El Cid, Jaime I entered Aragon and after seizing the villages that made up the northern part of the Moorish kingdom of Zayan, he entrusted the conquest of the castle and the area to his uncle, Bernardo Guillén de Entenza, known to the Muslims as Anuesa and to Christians as Lopuc. In this way, he hoped to establish a strongly protected front, which by means of the causeway that descended to the beach, would allow for aid from the galleys in the sea, thereby guaranteeing the enclosure of the city of Valencia. But the conqueror's failure to gather noblemen for the crusade forced him to leave the area once his armies were established in El Puig and commence a journey as propagator which would take him to the courts of Monzon. Having learned of the conqueror's departure, King Zayan formed a powerful army and tried to recover the fortress. In consequence, the Battle of Enesa broke out on August the 20th, 1237, in which troops sent by Guillén de Entenza Governor of Puch overthrew the Muslims. Standing in the place where this violent battle occurred is the hermitage devoted to St. Jordi, patron of the Aragonese arms and knight of the victory, according to the tradition that narrates his participation in the battle. But legend attributes the success of the conquest of Valencia to the discovery in the hills of an icon of Santa Maria, Virgin of El Puig, which would be proclaimed patron of the new kingdom by Jaime I. The extraordinary discovery of the icon constitutes without a doubt the raison d'etre of the sanctuary, superbly reflected in the Podian iconography in the alcove paintings by the Valencian painter Vergara. The alcove is a rectangular room built between 1766 and 1780, 
located behind the high altar in the east wing of the monastery. Once inside, we can observe the chapel's four angular pilasters of fluted wood with capitals and entablatures in the Corinthian style. Above the frieze, interrupted by the altar, four pendentives arch out, supporting the entablature of the oval-shaped dome. The themes we encounter are easily distinguishable in the text that legend and tradition maintain concerning the icon, stereotyped after the 16th century. Scarcely having moved the living body of Mary, Two heavenly ghosts appeared in the tomb of the Mother of God and uprooted a tombstone from the sacred enclosure and engraved an image of their queen. They ascended and searched from above for a satisfactory throne, noticing the tiny mountain of El Puig. They descended and hid the image in a cavity among the rocks. It remained there until the apostles James, Peter, and Paul appeared, found it, and worshipped it, building a chapel which was later visited by Romanized Spaniards. In the era of the Visigoths, some monks arrived at the sacred enclosure and erected a monastery near the chapel. On the rim of the bell in the tower they engraved, Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis, imago tua sit nobis tatrix, que fuit ab angelis in lapide sepulcri tui dedolata et ab es asportata, ea apostolorum adventu decorata, servi tui te colimus, abige fulgura. With the Muslim invasion of El Puig, fearing their treasure be desecrated, the monks uncovered a tomb and concealed the image underneath the bell in the Visigoth belfry, leaving once the burial had been performed. Several days later, the Muslims set fire to the convent and surrounding premises. Centuries went by, and the conqueror besieged Valencia from El Puig. At night time on several Saturdays, in the summer of 1237, the centuries watched on as seven stars fell from the sky over the terrace of the church. The Mercedarian master, Friar Pedro Nolasco, was notified and he subsequently ordered an excavation of the area. The heavy bronze was uncovered and further below the image of Santa Maria del Puig. The arrangement of the different scenes indicates a clear order of values. The scenes that narrate the surrender of Zayan, who presents the keys of the city of Valencia to the conqueror, and the offering of the latter before the altar of the Virgin, are scenes found in the elliptic frescoes of the lunettes of secondary importance. The pendentives are not in chronological order, as the angels engraving the icon and transporting it are found alongside the scene of the discovery which in this manner becomes magnified. On the other hand, the two themes of burial and discovery, which form part of the cask, are discreetly differentiated by ruins on one side and by Saracen horsemen on the other. In the center, and as a wild landscape in the form of a ring ties together the picture, the celestial vision of angels above cloud masses appears. But here the light is clearly related to its physical character. Moreover, the cosmic sun in the center is treated as a natural element, although there is an absence of realism in the garments, arms, and landscape. Contrary to the principles of medieval painting, a panel, a scene painted on the dome by Vergara, creates a unique homogeneous space in which the sequence of time-space so cherished by cubists, is resolved by means of themes, castle and ruins. In other words, a landscape that defines the times 
not the places. Burial and discovery. The perspective convergence is suggested in the heavenly vision. Leaving aside the traditional legend, the authenticity of the icon and its discovery cannot be denied, as proved by the note in Nadal's account. An image of the Virgin of Stone found here in El Puch when the conquest of this land took place. Or the oath of the conqueror. We vow to God at this altar, which is his mother's, that we will not traverse Teruel nor the Gildecona River until we have conquered Valencia. Therefore, the exquisite iconographic setting of the alcove reveals the existence of the Podian convent and summons us to enter the sanctuary. The sanctuary of El Puch, situated on the most elevated part of the headland, with rock permeating its monastic bulk, merges or connects with what Guerra calls the vertical constant with the mountain. An unmistaken relation exists between the heights and heavenly religions. Prela Robert explains the epithet Altissimus, unique to the gods, by the fact that they were worshipped on the pinnacles of the mountains, illustrated by a number of real examples. Olympus for the Hellenic gods, Fujiyama for the Japanese Shintoism, the Mon god of Javier, and man-made examples, ziggurats, pyramids, the temple of heaven in Peking. However, little remains of that small hermitage established by the conqueror. Tirso de Molina, Mercedarian who lived in El Puch, recounts in his Historia General how in the year 1300, Margarita de Laudia, countess of Terra Nova and daughter of the famous navigator, sponsored reconstruction of the current temple, which was finished around the year 1343, when the belfry was built. As we approach the entrance to the temple, we will come across the portal of the sanctuary, a transition from Romanic to Gothic style, constituting a unique exemplar of architecture in the area, not only for its rich iconography, but because it belongs to the original church erected after the conquest. According to accounts, in the year 1300, when reconstruction commenced, the entrance was moved from its original site in front of the main altar to its side location where we find it today. Its initial location in front of the angelic chapel is where we find the current ogival gate, which encloses the choir corresponding to the east-west orientation, typical of the Romanic temples. This phenomenon is explained by the fact that the apse image of divine space and nucleus of the consolidation of all the dynamic lines, both structural as well as symbolic, must receive the morning rays of the sun from the east, sun symbol of health, sol salutis, and the afternoon sun of justice. Sol Justicie. This requisite of orienting the nave of the temple was also the result of the baptismal ritual which compelled the neophyte to turn towards the west, the setting of the sun, to pronounce the Roman panacea, Abrenuntio Tibi Satana, and towards the east, the light, submerged in the baptismal water, to say, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Today, a monumental perron containing the stones of the antique Valencian flower market, designed by the architect Javier Gerlich, leads to the lovely church portal. It is formed by an attractive flared arch, slightly ogivated, and by three semicircles, progressively diminuted supported by three columns, respectively. The single structured columns have a thin impost running across the ornate capitals. The decorative bust relief of its four corbels and six capitals creates an authentic medieval setting 
in which ten scenes of the life of Christ and Mary were engraved. The Annunciation, the birth of Jesus, the worshipping of the wise men, the flight to Egypt, the beheading of the innocent, the wedding of Cana, the resurrection of Lazarus, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, and the kiss of Judas. The purpose of the symbolic reliefs is what Suger de Saint-Denis called leading the souls from materialbus ad immateriala, for which symbolism is used as a way of suggesting the spiritual form they may personify through bodily forms. Because as Daniel Rops pointed out, why would the master stonecutters bother to multiply the pages of those Bibles in stone, of those transparent Gospels, if the readers could not see more than the hieroglyphics? Evidently, if it has been said that the cathedral spoke to the illiterate person, the latter was able to understand its language. In the beautiful sculptured relief, a doctrinal and dogmatic creation pulsates, revealing the monk architect's scriptural thought, represented by the ornate and biblical character of the capitals. And if we take into consideration that the sanctuary was built as a result of the discovery of the icon, which would be worshipped at the altar of this sacred place and dedicated to the mystery of the Assumption of the Virgin, we can appreciate how the entire right side of the church portal represents the exaltation of Mary as the mother of Christ, beginning with the announcement of the birth of Christ. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. You shall conceive and give birth to a son, to whom you will name Jesus. The Lord shall give you the throne of David, his father, and of his reign there will be no end. The translation of the biblical passage engraved in the stone is exquisite. In addition, Romanesque iconography would consider Mary the exalted woman and would look for the characters in the Old Testament who prophesied her, Eve, Ave, the deliverance from sin of a woman by another woman, represented admirably in Giovanni da Fiesole's famous Annunciation. In this first set, the most interesting relief is the adoration, representing the presence of the wise men before the Maestas Mariae, the Virgin as Sovereign of the Saviour, an intercessor between man and God. The depiction of Mary holding the child on her right side is clearly related to the image that is worshipped in the temple. And if the Bible's source is valid, then the evangelist Matthew is the sole narrator of the Epiphany, and the influence of the apocryphal Gospels of the Nativity scene, and above all of the pseudo-Matthew, is unmistakably apparent in the figure of Mary. Two years gone by, some kings came to Jerusalem from the east. They entered the house and found the child sitting in the lap of his mother. It is precisely due to the assimilation of the iconographic source that this capital is that which best shows the relation to the appearing image. And since the portal of the sanctuary is the first iconographic prototype in which the latter is inscribed, the bas reliefs constitute a prologue in which the preceptive character and evangelical content express the meaning of the temple. The tympanum and the mullion, which were formerly here, were removed in 1649 at the request of the superior, the monk Clemente Hill, so as to make room for larger doors. Though it is not certain as to why the mullion was removed, it was probably to allow for the passing of processions, as occurred with many other doorways. The portal of the apostles in the Cathedral of Valencia was widened in order to allow for the procession 
that bore the body of San Mauro. On the right side of the door, the last three reliefs are dedicated to the Passion, so cherished by the Romanesque, and which commences with the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The two preceding scenes show the miracles of Christ, evidence of his divineness, which are carefully chosen. The wedding of Cana, in which Mary acts as mediator, and the resurrection of Lazarus, in which Jesus participates for his love to mankind. For that reason, the great symbolic and dogmatic content included in the Gospels make these ornate reliefs mere introductory prologues to readings and sermons that without a doubt took place in the temple's interior. Their material simplicity would make them more reflexive and suggestive. The underlying theme in this sculptural series, with emphasis on Christ being sent, Annunciation, birth, and on the Redeemer, Lazarus, passion, reflects the Mercedarian spirit recorded in the constitutions of Father Amer of 1272, and based on the parallelism, Christ, mercy, the latter being found in the history of salvation of the church, making it essentially missionary. Observing this beautiful, enlightening entrance to the temple, we notice a hidden eye or window uncovered in 1964 during restoration, which not only serves as a source of illumination, but also possesses a hidden symbolic interpretation. Its origins should be traced to the repercussion that the worshipping of the sun had on Christianity. Christ would be the sole invictus, the triumphant sun. It is this symbolic relationship with the pagan Helio soul in regard to the eye which sees all, hence its name, and therefore all seeing and all present, which can be identified with the eye of the God judge and explains its location on the west facade of the primitive temple where it was first placed to retake the son of justice from eschatology. This shows that whoever walled up the eye and changed its placement quite obviously was unaware of its symbolic value. The eye hole was uncovered when restoration was begun on the church in 1964 and reopened with the placement of a similar aperture to that of the Seo de Valencia. It was later substituted for the present one in which the 12 foliated curvatures that project radially from the center suggest the solar symbolism. Entering the temple, we observe that it is formed by three naves with five corridors, flanked by ten chapels, five on each side. Their transversal walls make up the buttresses of the robust main and diagonal arches of the three naves. The diagonal arches maintain a uniform profile and width without narrowing at the springing point as they intersect the angles formed by the arches with projecting ribs. The growing vaults are quite archaic and simple, a structure made up of six arches, four front arches and two that cross diagonally. Four tympanums are supported without any link by these arches. The ogival windows are very narrow and are placed at the springing points of the groin vaults on slightly elevated walls, opening just above the archways. But even if a building does not necessarily have to symbolize anything, the Church of Santa Maria, as in most religiously oriented architecture, does not cease its primary missionary function as a public place of prayer, but because of its tectonic character, offers a symbolism within reach of the lay person. And in order to appreciate the architecture of the sanctuary, 
we ought to remember that the consideration given to the Christian temples as a prefiguration of the heavenly Jerusalem led medieval philosophers and writers Honorius, Suger de Saint-Denis, Cicardo de Cremona to search for a deeper symbolism in the church's elements and structures. So it is not surprising that for a man in the Middle Ages saturated with the idea of the supernatural the temple represented the threshold of paradise, the symbol of God's kingdom on earth, the heavenly city, for which the church was the illusory image of the evocation of apocalypsis in the passage of heavenly Jerusalem, which would constitute the most important biblical source. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. Its splendor was as a most precious stone, like clear crystal jasper, the city is four square, its walls of jasper and city streets of pure gold, like pure glass. But the depiction of the city of God, or of the heavenly Jerusalem, is clearly interpreted in El Puch. The temple as God's dwelling place in the Cistercian order, the Mercedarians were white monks, and in the Augustinian order, which accounts for the symbolic importance of its architecture, having its origins in monastic philosophy of San Bernardo and in the aesthetic principles of San Agustin. The intellect can only be satisfied by beauty, in forms of beauty, in the proportion of those forms, in the amount of that proportion. In this respect, the Bishop of Hippona's interpretation of the excerpt of the wisdom but you have put order to everything with measure, number, and weight. His mistrust in the artistic images defined as false and illusory, and his devotion to the logical reasoning of mathematical geometric correlations shaped the aesthetics which limited the creative process of certain mathematical rules, that is, the perfect reasons of Pythagorean mysticism. Archaeological data concerning El Puch reveals that the church's appearance or style is based on Augustinian reasoning, one to one, two to three, and three to four. And its architecture is founded on the paradigm of the Unitarian vision of the cosmos. But in the quadrant reason one to one of the apse and the structure of the naves, Christian quaternary symbolism concurs. The four rivers of Genesis, the four horsemen of the Apocalypse. In this sense, the theory proposed by Riza and accepted by Simpson that the symbols employed by the master stonecutters have their origins in geometric figures is supported by the fact that there are symbols on the church's wall against the high cloister that seal the Augustinian style of the temple. Above all, the Podian architecture constitutes the visible representation of an ethic in which Bernardine influence is latent, in the simpleness of geometric cubes, in the iconophobic radicalism, in the austerity, in the constructive brutality, in the structural graphics. To summarize, in that the tectonic became once again following a silence during the reformation of Caseus in the 18th century after the repristination, the true protagonist of the sanctuary. The influence of scholasticism is also apparent in the hierarchy of what Penofsky calls logical levels, in the use of homology as a means to consolidate the graphic and physical resources. For that reason, the temple is above all a house of prayer the musical analogy, a meeting place with God, inaccessible light. The roof, as it is today, with sloping gables of roof tiles and rock-like covering, constitutes a kind of mask or disguise that is unsettling to the profile of the sanctuary. Its construction, the result of functional reasoning, characteristic of the 18th century, as that of the Caseus Reformation, 
creates a contradiction with Gothic repristination, according to accounts. The church was completed with high terraces, the monastery seen as a structure created from rock based on Cistercian aesthetics today displays a roof which is totally erroneous. The monastery of El Puch does not fit the definition of Gothic architecture. Transparent and implies an architectural style described as shining and with precious stones, the heavenly Jerusalem of the apocalyptic passage. The symbolic principles within the colorful Gothic context obeyed in its totality the visualization of the theme, God as the light of the world, in the temple's interior. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. For that reason, the disappearance of these magical, translucent pains during the Spanish Civil War or in the Second World War not only deprived Western civilization of iconographic texts, but also erase the most exquisite examples of the aesthetics of light or theology of light. The difference which exists between the windows in the church of El Puch and those of the Gothic cathedral is not merely one of size or of quantity, it's a solid bay window, but of functional purpose and therefore symbolic purpose. And the architectural style of Santa Maria is Augustinian for its design and configuration. But above all, it is Cistercian for its stylistic characteristics of severity and abstraction. Because its harsh austerity implies a return to the beginning, a notion of the temple more as a place for prayer than as a heavenly space, and above all, because the bay window preserves the mysticism of light. King of kings, Lord of Lords, the only immortal who dwells amidst inaccessible light, who no man has ever seen or can see. It is this consideration of the bay window as a source of light, as a filter, which makes it possible to perceive the tectonic system and the visual axis, east-west, Rosetta apse, and allows us to be transported to the Augustinian metaphysical order. The font is one of the few remains belonging to the primitive temple built in the 13th century. Its marble outline is encompassed by four heads and its pedestal is an oval piece which undoubtedly was once part of a tomb in the monastery and contrasts with the Latin Byzantine style. Heir to the Cantharus tradition, or fountain of ablutions, set in the atrium of the ancient churches, it is a valuable archaeological and historical piece that expresses the ritual of the holy water in Christianity and in the liturgy. Instructive character, its underlying meaning, all artwork is closely related to a specific vision of the world with precise symbolic values. For that reason, its history embraces the history of a symbol of principles. Essential to the Podian construction is its funereal composition the post-mortem invasion of laymen. Upon the death of Jaime I, the monastery of El Puch was entrusted to Margarita de Lauria, famous for promoting the project of reconstruction that continued throughout 1343, according to various codicils. And a palace was erected against the temple. Reconstruction is no longer possible due to the disappearance of the scrolls of Ballester of 1640. Royal annexations such as the palace, royal house, sepulchres, are testimony to the wealth of the House of Aragon, making the sanctuary a unique pantheon of Valencian nobility.
as were Poblet and Santis Creus for the Aragonese kings, and Wilgas for the Castilian nobility. The association between the royal palace and the monastery, despite the prestigious exemplars left to us from medieval Europe, Aquisgran, Westminster, Saint Denis, Kremlin, acquires in Spain, Oña, Leir, Santa Maria de Ripoll, Veruela, an importance which cannot be compared to the rest of Europe. San Lorenzo del Escorial being the finest monastic example of the Spanish monarchy, as Professor Chueca points out. The demoralizing activity on the part of 19th century liberal politicians, the secularization of monks, and later on the civil war, all brought about the devastation of the building and destruction of most of the graves, true works of funereal art. The tomb of Bernardo Guillén de Entenza, now rebuilt, constitutes a funereal monument in white marble in the form of a casket, sarcophagus, and is an accurate representation of Gothic iconography. On the cover lays the figure of Bernardo de Entenza, which Teodoro Llorente described in this manner. His head is covered by a capelin with a spiked trim and a chain mail coif in double netting. He is dressed in a cuirass with a shield or coat of arms. It hangs from the military belt, adorned with braids and clover, a crosspiece sword and a misericord dagger on his legs, protected by knee pads, angular shin guards are worn and silver foot coverings. The tectonic scene represented on the tomb, in which different scenes of the duel take place, helps the sculptor to define the relation interior-exterior of the temple, to place the monster guardians, griffins and monsters of medieval fables, as well as the funereal party, and the combination of window and rosette provides us with the interpretation previously offered by Hugh Libergier, concerning St. Nicais. The location of Margarita and Roberto de Lauria's grave in the most prominent place of the temple would convert the apse into a true funereal chapel made complete by the burial of the Duke and Duchess of Segorbi at the base of the high altar. The right of the landlord master was the right to a burial place. After the devastation of 1936, the sepulcher appears dreadfully disfigured, both physically as well as symbolically. Nevertheless, thanks to Zapata's drawings, Peiro's paintings, Sartho Carrere's photographs and texts, Teodoro Lorente's descriptions, and to the remains that can be observed in the monastery, we are able to relive such splendid memories. In this manner, we can see how the cover of the marble coffin had two slanting flat surfaces in the form of a coffer or caisson. And next to the presbytery, the recumbent statue of Princess Margarita, her legs resting on a little dog, symbol of loyalty. On the other side lies the statue of her brother, armed and resting his head on two cushions, and at his feet a lion custodian of the sacred and guardian of the night's eternal sleep. Both the material and symbolic wealth of this tomb is of such importance that until it is rebuilt, El Puch will continue to be lacking in one of its most splendid treasures, testimony to the link between the monarchy and the Podian sanctuary. But several other tombs of distinguished Mercedarians remain in El Puig, such as those of Friar Pedro de Amer, Friar Raimundo Albert, constituting precious archaeological wealth represented by the monks' vestments and habits of the 13th century. The uppermost part of the apse is dominated by the icon of the Virgin, 
framed by a fresco which depicts the visit of noblemen and prelates to the sanctuary. As we approach the high altar, we can observe the high relief, the stone of which, according to tradition, belonged to the Virgin's tomb, which was found in El Puch, according to records of Nadal, 1448, and Company, 1472. The polychromy of the icon is exquisite. The throne or chair of the Virgin, shaped as a chest with a back support but no arms, has a gilded frame. The ochre cushion has gold stripes and the color of the chair back is an ivory white with an arabesque of laurels in black. The cloak is dark blue, lined in red, the tunic gold. A golden hairnet covers the hair and pointed cardinal red shoes cover the feet. The child is dressed in a chestnut colored dalmatic with golden stripes and wears from the waist a short skirt in gold and highlighted in nacre white. The figure of the high relief of El Puch represents the mother of God, virgin with the child, in sede majestatis, sitting on her throne without crown or jewels. Its oriental origins are revealed through the physical characteristics which correspond to the Byzantine sculpture of the 6th and 7th centuries. A marked relief over the marble-like stone, disproportion in some of the elements, hands, chin and head of the Virgin, and garments of an intense color. In many icons, we can observe a thematic likeness and a stylistic similarity to the Madonna of El Puch, and which confirms their relation to the Byzantine sculpture. One of the most illustrative representations is the ivory tablet we behold depicting the enthroned virgin with the child sitting on her knees, preserved in the Museum of Cleveland, Ohio. Concerning Byzantine sculpture, the image of the Hodogentria, Virgin of the Messengers, a small ivory statue of the 10th century preserved in the Metropolitan Museum, was the prototype of Western models representing Mary with the child in arms. Some unusual features can be noted in the image in El Puch. Perhaps the most interesting is that of the child being supported by the right hand as the Theotokos de Vladimir. The high relief has two possible iconographic sources, both from the New Testament. The Virgin as mediator in the Last Judgment and as wise sea, and the Epiphany. If the first source can be seen in the two winged busts, advocate angels, then the fact that Podian tradition attributes the creation of the relief to the angels, for which the image would be worshipped under the invocation of Blessed Virgin Mary of the angels, as well as its typological origins, makes the Epiphany passage of Pseudo-Matthew, and the Dorth's capital is the best example, the biblical source which converges with the iconography of the sanctuary. After two years had passed, some wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. They entered the house and found the child sitting on his mother's lap. If it is true that this paradigmatic typology offers a specific symbolic interpretation, the Theotokos, or Mother of God, in Sede Majestatis, also acquires its own meaning within the iconographic context in which it is recorded. If this representation of Byzantine tradition was unchanging throughout Romanic iconography, the image of El Puch will be that which defines the iconographic repertory of the temple, the portal is a clear example, in which its original symbolic content, intended by the artisan, was completed with the building of the temple as a result of the conquest of Valencia, enriching its meaning through medieval religious philosophy and Mercedarian spirituality.
Throughout history, architecture has been one of the most expressive idioms of human adventure, an imperative testimony for understanding our destiny. Little remains of the primitive Podian convent annexed to the church which Margarita de Lauria had rebuilt in 1300. The crypt we behold is one of the oldest pieces of evidence that can still be admired in El Puch, as during the last 30 years of the 18th century, for purposes of renovation, the monastery had to be destroyed. The monastery's architecture construction continued over a period of nearly 200 years from 1588 to 1780 should be understood in the context of Western monastic typologies divulged by the Cistercians and within the framework of Valencian construction tendencies of the 16th century in which the Escorialian style was of great importance. The first stone of the massive convent was placed on September the 1st, 1588, in the South Tower and was blessed by the patriarch Juan de Rivera. The first receipt was signed by the master builder four months after construction was begun. I, Anton Dextado de la Cosa, acknowledge receipt of 50 pounds in Spanish coins from Señor Procurator Friar Honorato Murta representative of the house of the convent of Our Lady of El Puche. To cover part of the cost of the building, I am obliged to construct the same convent. The well-documented subject matter concerning the convent permits a brief reconstruction of what was a lengthy process of edification of the monastic enclosure. We know that on November 22, 1666, the elevation which leads to the convent's door was begun with the entrance and round arch located at the end of the ramp. It was finished on the 18th of March, 1667, and the uppermost part of the arch was completed on June 21st, 1670. The entire wall is made of dry rubble work, except for the corner and the arch, which are done in ashlar stone masonry. On the upper part, we can see a stone cross with the crucifix on the obverse and the Virgin and Child on the reverse. The building is rectangular shaped, marked by four robust angular towers in each corner, all with square bases except for the most ancient one which is rectangular based. Its four exterior walls coincide with the direction of the four cardinal points due to the orientation of the primitive Gothic church which gave rise to the creation of the great monastery according to the Bernardinian plan. A large cloister appears in the center with two wide adjoining corridors on the east, south and west sides. The internal corridor defines the horizontal movement on the various levels, while the external corridor houses the various chambers necessary to the monastic existence. In other times, one could get a glimpse from the podium of the ancient villages of Cebola and Enesa, of which no trace remains today. The typography and the sloping hillside influence and determine the construction of the monastery. Consequently, the lower levels are not as extensive as the upper, and the rusty-colored rocks crop up, being left exposed in the interior. The edifice naturally catered to the functional needs of each of its levels and therefore to the distribution of the accesses. To the temple on the north side, looking out over the village, to the monastery on the east side where the main entrance and stairs are located with possible secondary passageways. The entrance to the farm workers' living quarters was located near the entry to the convent and next to the southeast tower, 
with an open gate on the south side in order to allow for passing to and from the large orchards and cultivated lands. The monastery's shape and design was characterized by serenity and clarity. The church, totally integrated into the monastic bulk, stands out, if only for its greater dimension. The first two floors of the monastery, which were at an elevation equivalent to the immense water tank built in 1691 by the architect Francisco La Piedra, served as the farm workers' living quarters and as a place for the grain loft, wine cellars, oil mills, wine and olive presses. The restorative work in these chambers of the convent is noticeable and reveals a formal endeavor which underlines the tectonic architectural element with selected resources of neo-academic rationalism. The second floor is reached by a staircase with carved railings and banisters from the 18th century. The lower cloister is made up of four wings with 36 bay windows with access to the interior patio. Today, it is difficult to appreciate the pedagogic composition of the convent, with its cloisters left bare of the original decor, and its paintings hanging in museums elsewhere, in many cases unrecognizable after the devastation of the Civil War. Consequently, it is nearly impossible to trace the story narrated in the series of canvases to grasp the moral and theological meaning that could train friars in meditation and prepare novices. However, as restitution of these canvases is not feasible, new works hang from the monastery's walls, many belonging to the convent itself, such as the oval-shaped canvases depicting Mercedarian martyrs painted by José Vergara, of intrinsic value since their order has little to do with a theological lesson or endeavor to teach the novice. Little remains of the primitive convent today. Lack of an archaeological investigation before restoration took place has all but erased the possibility of reconstructing an important period in the history of the monastery. For that reason, the crypt is one of the most fascinating features of the monastic enclosure. Most striking are the arched walls and the ceiling in three panels with segmented domes, perpendicular to the naves of the temple, as well as the jagged rock that permeates the walls of the crypt, evidence that the foundation of the building rests on the massive reddish rock. The north wing of the cloister opens into the monastic refectory, built in 1670 and restored in 1966. A two-story rectangular room, it is covered by a lovely lowered dome and sustained by six molded arches with detailed adornment, preserving its enigmatic initials decorated with graffito on the frieze of the entablature which honor the first Messinas, Friar Jose Sanchez, father of the Order of Our Lady of Mercy. Right in front of the refectory is the room de profundis, reverence. At the entrance, a commemorative tablet from the year 1670 hangs in remembrance of the Reverend Father Friar Jose Sanchez, which reads, to his most reverend father, Friar Jose Sanchez, great and most vigilant prelate of all religion, most illustrious male, gifted with all gender. The rectangular chapel is illuminated by large windows on the west side of the monastery. The wall at the far end is made of decorative brick dating back to the 17th century, interrupted by two oval openings or closets. An enormous lamp hangs from the center of the white ceiling, 
made of forged iron with 24 large torch or candle holders, as well as other nobiliary shields. A precious icon forms the Sacrarium, elaborated in delicate colors, representing the Maestas Domini, the child framed by a circular clipius in the bosom of his mother, with a beautiful silver repoussé frame. On the tiled baseboard, we can admire 16 ceramic designs from Manises depicting scenes of the life of San Jose. These multicolored tiles serve to decorate the inside of the temple as a result of the restorative work carried out by P. Caseus. The tiles were restored in 1965, mounted on forged iron frames and hung in the new private oratory, formerly the Sala de Profundis of the Mercedarian community. Several canvases pertaining to the Valencian school of the 17th century complete the decoration of this room. The Lady of Our Mercy bestowing her scapulary to San Pedro Nolasco, set in a lovely Baroque panel, stands out among the many canvases. The upper cloister is perfectly modulated and covered by intersecting domes over segmented arches which terminate over a stylized entablature, decorated in greys in accord with the tastes of the 16th century. The cadence of the angels is integrated by the duplication of the arches. The windows here are larger, but their interior remains flared. The dichotomy inside-outside is emphasized by the distinctive form, interior-exterior, of the opening, as well as by the difference in use in both aspects, brick-plaster, open-closed, straight-curved. Contrary to Palladianism, the alternating of arches and entablatures in the cloister of Cartuja de Porta Coeli or in the most Italianized aspect of the cloister of the school of Corpus Christi, El Puch suggests the elevation of the patio of the knights. It is not surprising that the monks were a military order, and the use of a purified classic principle, escorialian or rectilinear. In the patio of the monastery, the principle of order is understood as a structural concept, and the orders as its linguistic code. And since the dimensions of the patio call for three windows, headsets were used, although today, since they are walled up with concrete, they constitute a mute or empty reference to the past. Classicism implies a systematic posture. The square columns, superpositions, corners, friezes, entablatures, cornices, are all codified within the walls of this open space and controlled by a criteria of design of visual and spatial logic. From the patio, the belfry, or opus campanilis, can be seen. In 1670, work was begun to complete this structure. It is square-shaped and covered by four sloping roofs and crowned by an iron weather vane which represents the scene of the Virgin of El Puch. Four windows, framed by arches with two to four circumference at their springing point, joined by an elevated lintel, lend symmetry to this tower, which today can still be admired in all its beauty. The stone base and brick pinnacle fuse the concept of the two most relevant compositional elements, the patio and the temple. The hierarchical arrangement of the monastery is interpreted not only by the spatial and material importance of the cloister, but also by the repertory of the various portals which possess a classic Serlian style. The door that connects the stairs with the cloister should be considered. Made of stone, 
two columns supported on their respective pedestals with Tuscan capitals sustain an entablature crowned by a triangular pediment. This same design is repeated on the adjoining door topped by three spheres. Also worth pointing out is the door that leads to the royal drawing room. The jams of the door appear level with the walls, though after restoration a frame of decorative stone was incorporated. A piece of molding and two tiny abaci, the uppermost slab of a column, over metopa and a divided pediment lead to the bronze coat of arms pertaining to the Spanish monarchs of the House of Bourbon. The regal room, located in the southeast tower, brings to mind the royal trust and possessions or property which the monarchy kept in the monastery. Two charred brick panels by the artist Jaime Descalz Aracil hang on the walls. Without a doubt, as we behold the Podian sanctuary, the contrast between the Gothic temple and the convent is striking. Nevertheless, the chapels flanking the cloister bear witness to an important transformation in the church that took place at the time that Father Caseus was prelate. The change consisted in adapting the Gothic Cistercian style to the neoclassic style. Carried out between 1744 and 1749, it was one of the later tasks to be executed within the work performed on the monastery, which lasted nearly two centuries. Repristination has erased the white walls and Corinthian decoration of the new church, which was a reproduction of the Albertinian universe. There is no doubt in my mind that the purity and simplicity of color and of life is what pleases God most. The philosophy and history of a religious community remain immersed in the impressive monastic architecture. A community that came with the conqueror to these lands as friar soldiers and who over the centuries built a home, a house of prayer. For this reason, the sanctuary's architectural style serves as an example of the Unitarian vision of the cosmos, merging the divine with the human, adopting the Augustinian principle of number as the foundation for metaphysical order and aesthetic perfection. As one casts a final glance at the monastery of El Puig, the words of Professor Chueca should be remembered. Architecture is one of the greatest forms of expressing the spirit of a people, history and intra-history in itself. It is for this reason that El Puig will never be the romantic ruins of an irrecoverable past, the petrification of a glance filled with nostalgia at a legendary yesterday. By understanding this Marian monument, we are able to partake in the discovery of part of its historical and aesthetic wealth. Its architecture constitutes a material and perceptual expression of Christian philosophy and of monastic reflection. Therefore, as we behold and ponder its existence, we are in turn made aware of its message and of the essential and existential character of architecture, its commitment to mankind. History is a necessity, not only to make life more pleasant, but also to give it moral meaning. That which is absent becomes present, the old is rejuvenated, and the young acquire early on the maturity of the old. If a 70-year-old man is said to be wise through experience, how much wiser be he whose life spans 1,000 or 3,000 years? It can be said then that a man has lived as many thousands of years as his knowledge of history encompasses.